there really is a mindset to being a social entrepreneur. And that is someone who is innovative, creative. These people are problem solvers. They're fascinating to be around, really great fun to talk with. But they are also uh, strategic. They are looking for the right timing to match their values-driven interests to the needs of the business. They're not just throwing things against the wall. They're really skillful navigators of organizational systems. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle & Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nestle. Hello everyone, Jack here. Today we have a fun topic and idea. We're going to discuss the organizational culture and its impact on organizational change. More specifically, in this episode, we will discuss innovation and the concept of social movements within organizations as a mechanism to lead positive change. In this episode, we will discuss changing your company from the inside out with Christopher White. Changing your company from the inside out is the title of our guest book, along with its co-author, Gerald Davis. Chris is principal at Riverbank Consulting Group, a strategic culture transformation consulting firm. He is also a faculty associate at the Center for Positive Organizations at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. And Chris has been leading and consulting to purpose-driven organizations for more than 20 years. And he is a recipient of the Aspen Institute's Ideas Worth Teaching Award for Excellence in Business Education. And his thought leadership has been widely featured, including by TED, HBR, Forbes, Fast Company, Inc., and Chief Executive magazine. Joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Jack. Thanks for having me. This will be fun. Uh, Chris, but before we get started, can you please introduce yourself further to our listeners? Sure. Um, I was thinking about how to introduce myself beforehand, and I, I was reflecting that really I've had a passion for building and creating for my entire life, probably even before I was born. One little fun fact is that my grandfather on my mom's side, my mom's dad, uh, was a bricklayer. He built beautiful dry stone walls um, for his his work and was really proud of the work he did creating these, these walls around town. And my grandfather on my dad's side, my dad's dad, worked uh, in support of architects. And so I think really it's been in my blood for before I was even born just to create and build. And I've just chosen yeah, yeah. to do it in organizational life (laughs) interesting yeah yeah, so these days what that looks like practically is that uh, i wear a couple of hats um i spend time at the ross business school i've been teaching their mbas and executives for over 10 years now and mostly in leadership organizational change leadership development and about five years ago i set out to create Riverbank as a way to get really practical and hands-on and tangible. And how does all that award-winning research show up in organizational life to make a difference in the results that people get and the experience that people have along the way? Awesome, Chris. Uh, Thank you for that. I'm really excited uh, to have you on today because your organizational change background obviously means you have a lot of expertise implementing tactics. Uh, you know, for positive or organizational change and your insight is going to be valuable for sure. So looking forward to it. Uh, listeners, all of us here at the ERP OCJ hope you find this podcast useful as we share lessons learned, discover best practices and explore the human element components of ERP organizational change. Please stay with us till the end. Chris will have an actionable golden nugget of advice based on today's conversation. Our conversations here are built around the listen and learn approach, but it's when you apply what you've learned that you begin to move the needle forward. So let's dive in. So Chris, my first question for you is, how would you define organizational culture? I think that culture drives the how of organizational life. It's really the sum of all of the beliefs and assumptions and values and processes and systems and incentives uh, that leads to the visible behaviors and relationships that we see. 
Yeah. And um, Chris, on your website, you it, it mentions that we believe in organizations leaders often have the raw ability to create cultural change, but they may need support and coaching to make it work in practice. So, you know, you, you define organizational culture and what that means in general. And obviously a key piece of that, you know, setting the tone with the culture is through leadership. So how would you define good leadership then? <laughs> That's a I, I, yeah, yeah I, I'm laughing, Jack, because uh, you reminded me of just being a, a leader is really hard. And, and I don't just define leaders as CEOs, right? It's uh, people who have followers in organizations are leaders. Uh, and so that can happen at any part of the organization uh, with or without a formal title. Uh, but I think of good leadership as organizing and uplifting people to create extraordinary results. So you've got to get the results, but leaders... Uh, get both to the destination, but also create an experience along the way. You can also kind of break it down a little bit. Uh, I often reference with my MBAs, John Carter and his famous HBR article, What Leaders Really Do. He, he broke it down into four pieces, set a direction, create alignment, motivate people, and create a culture of leadership so that you're developing people along the way. And in practice, that can look like challenging people or teaching or coaching or encouraging or making really tough decisions, uh, this or that, up or down. What's it going to be? You know, Chris, you'd mentioned earlier in your intro that being a part of uh, Michigan's Ross School of Business and doing some great research and science in terms of organizational culture, and, you know, you just defined what organizational culture is, and then you just shared what, in part, good leadership looks like. But what impact does good leadership have on organizational change exactly? But more importantly, how do we know? How do we know that leadership has an impact on organizational change? Well, there's certainly, Jack, a lot of uh, research into leadership and organizational change and what that looks like. But I think given the folks we have listening on the phone here, all of us have, have had good leaders and have had bad leaders and all of yeah. us have been part of successful coaches and, and change efforts and unsuccessful ones. And so I think um, the experience stands on its own with that. But uh, really, I'd like just though to take us back to the three elements I was giving before I shared Cotter's four elements of, of leadership. Uh, think about the three elements there of organizing and uplifting people and achieving extraordinary results. Uh, the work of leaders coming into organizing people, there, that can be frontline supervisors, that can be directors, that can be VPs, that can be top executives uh, in different ways, uplifting people in the day-to-day -day and in the incentives and in the culture that's created. Uh, and then the extraordinary results, make sure we're aiming for the right mountain. Uh, you can talk of, of uh, case studies of organizations going after the, the wrong mountain and achieving results, but the wrong kind of results. Um, yeah. But then uh, organizations going after the right mountain and exceeding all possibilities. So let me give a little anecdote for you about uh, successful organizational change and leadership. And that's why did we choose the name Riverbank in the first place for, for our firm? Uh, and really it's because it's a metaphor for change. Think about our change efforts we were talking about a moment ago, Jack, and so many times leaders try and change organizations and organizational culture by wading into the water of the river and kind of splashing around. And people often roll their eyes in those kind of organizational change efforts. Uh, uh, they perceive it as a flavor of the month and the water splashes around, but ultimately just flows around the leader, doesn't it? It just keeps going where it was going to go in the first place and it resets to where things were. And so the name Riverbank we chose because we believe that uh, leaders creating sustainable organizational change need to do the hard civil engineering work of, of structuring and re resetting the riverbanks themselves and the water then will sustainably flow where it needs to go. Um, it won't just revert to, to how things were before uh, down the path. So that 
riverbank metaphor holds true when it comes to leadership and organizational change. And when we think of building the riverbank and uh, being curious is the B, U is unleash influences, I is infuse purpose and vision, L, lead positively, and D is deepen the change. And that's really our, our uh, perspective on leadership and organizational change to your, to your question, Jack. Wow, Chris, that, that is a fantastic metaphor and analogy. That's a really, really good way to describe that relationship between leadership and, and organizational culture. Well, thanks for that, Chris. So a, a question for you, you know, in your book, uh, obviously the topic of today's conversation uh, in the title, again, is changing your company from the inside out, a guide for social entrepreneurs. So Chris, I understand the first part. That makes sense. But I want to focus on the second part of your title. What is a social entrepreneur? And uh, what's that got to do with changing the company? So a social entrepreneur, and that's kind of a bit of a mouthful of a term for anyone. And so Jerry and I, since we wrote the book, have kind of backed away from using it so much in regular speech. Uh, but we think about it as someone who creates positive change without authority in organizations. It's someone who creates positive change without authority in organizations. And all of us can relate to that, right? That everyone, including the CEO, is trying to create positive change. And even the CEO reports to the board or shareholders. But positive change, you can think of as advancing objectives for the business, the bottom line, advancing the business strategy or the bottom line goals, but also creating some additional good. And that's where really... a it's a social innovation. And without authority means that they're going above and beyond their mandate, their job description. Um, and in organizations, we're talking about people in the organization as opposed to entrepreneurs outside the organization. So that's the entrepreneur part. Interesting. Okay. So let's let's dive a little deeper, Chris. Sure. And, and I, I really love that idea, um, you know, someone who creates positive change without authority. And that statement alone is probably an hour long conversation, I think, easy. Uh -huh. But I, I love that. But so that being the case, then uh, you had mentioned this idea of social innovation. So please uh, explain to our listeners, what is social innovation? And where does it come from then? So a social innovation could take many different forms. We, we tend to break it down into four P's. Uh, it could be a product or a service. It could be a social innovation that uh, process how things are done. Uh, supply chain, for instance, uh, supply chain management and uh, greening the supply chain. It could be the third P of people. Uh, it could be treating people well, organizational culture, inclusion, belonging in the workplace, um, human rights. And then finally, it can be public. So how the business itself relates to the community around it. And so there's, there's four kind of categories of social innovation and just an endless list of ways that businesses can improve from the inside out in ways that are good for the bottom line, good for the business, and uh, have that additional impact. And really good entrepreneurs just have a running list of possibilities things that they'd like to do, improvements they see, innovations they see, and are really just looking for the right time and conditions to move any one of them along. So Jack, to, to the question of where do these ideas come from? Where do these social innovations come from? There really is a mindset to being a social entrepreneur, and that is someone who is innovative, creative, these people are problem solvers. They're fascinating to be around, really great fun to talk with. But they are also uh, strategic. They are looking for the right timing to match their values-driven interests to the needs of the business. They're not just throwing things against the wall. They're really skillful navigators of organizational systems. So I, I think what you're saying, Chris, then is essentially these social entrepreneurs, which are highly innovative people. And as you'd mentioned earlier, you define those as someone who creates positive change without authority, uh, which I think is a very powerful idea. Uh, and then you mentioned these ideas such as mindset, innovation, value driven interests, skillful navigators. So in a sense, they may not have any authority. In fact, they may not even have anybody that reports to them in the traditional sense, but they're probably great leaders, aren't they? 
I think they are, with or without a formal title. Yeah. And my next question was going to be then, you know, how is the social innovation idea important to organizational change? And I think you answered uh, that question with your, your response to the previous one. And that is when you have somebody who is on board, and you just mentioned yourself for this idea of having a vision and a mission, even though it might be, again, without authority, uh, if they're on board to the change and they're, they're a positive contribution to that culture, well, then they're a significant contribution to the organizational change effort. I, I really like how you put that. Jack, and, and the way I often think about it is that the CEOs, including the CEOs we work with at uh, Riverbank, don't have all the answers and don't have all the energy and drive and resources that they need. They don't have all the solutions to how the organizational change is going to come about. You probably saw just this week Gallup updated their uh, engagement survey scores, and you will have seen that 32% of the American workforce right now is actively engaged. Yeah, That means that, that the remaining 68%, if my math is right, are less <laughs> than that. <laughs> and uh, it's really one way to think about entrepreneurs is that they are at the extreme positive deviant end of that spectrum. They're the yeah. people who are doing a great, great job for their day job and are going above and beyond to find additional solutions that meet the needs of the business while having more and more impact on the stakeholders around them. And so they're mm -hmm. really the, the people who are filling in the blanks of the idea gap and the energy gap uh, for where the organization wants to go. Yeah. And in fact, you know, you discuss in your book, the social entrepreneurs basically create the social movements. And, um, and they do so with what I would consider, you know, pretty high quality leadership attributes. And in fact, uh, Chris, you mentioned in your book, and I'm going to share a short quote here, but you share the quote, successful social movements tend to follow a playbook that can be seen as answers to four questions, end quote. But then you talk about when is the right time for a change and how do you know why and how do you make the case for a change? and who should be involved and what are the social networks involved in that change. And then lastly, you talk about this idea of, you know, how should they or the organizations press for that change? So I, I guess, can you share with our listeners a little more about when is the right time for change and how do you know? And, you know, as a, as a leadership team within an organization, right? I mean, you, there must be some sort of reason for the change and, and some sort of business case for the change. And then that change needs to be synchronized within the organization in terms of communication and alignment of your mission, your vision, your values, and so forth, right? And then, of course, at some point there, when you have these social entrepreneurs kind of jump on board and help you kind of lead that charge in a way, you know, there's some alignment there with this whole organizational vision in which the social entrepreneurs create the, the social movement, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Chris, in other words, let, let me try to re-articulate that question. And, you know, I think, you know, sometimes when you talk about this idea of social movements and this really powerful idea of someone who creates positive change without authority, it seems to me that they can be the reason that kind of creates that social movement for change and for organizational change. So it kind of seems like, you know, perhaps it's more from the bottom up, uh, so to speak. And maybe sometimes these social movements start from the top down where the organizational leadership says, hey, for some reason, you know, we have this significant organizational change we need to make or, or change in our culture. And then what happens is that percolates throughout the organization. You then have the social movements that are driven by you know, these social entrepreneurs. So it seems like it could go both ways as far as what initiates the change. You know, I know it's a pretty wide open question, but um, <laughs> but I, I guess that's, you know, when I say what is the right time for change and how do you know, maybe in that context is, what, what would you have to say about that? Absolutely. And I think in, in breaking that down a little bit, you can think about external triggers and internal signals for change. Really, over the last decade, one of the most fascinating evolutions, I think, has been the extent to which the boundaries between the company's internal life and external life are getting blurry. 
has influenced how decisions are made. You think about uh, various companies being involved in uh, military activities, creating whether it be weapons, whether it be systems that support war, uh, and employee activism that has led to decisions to get out of those businesses for some of the big companies. Um, then you think about some of the social issues, such as the Google walkouts uh, in relation to how people were perceived as getting fewer opportunities at Google. The CEO of Uber was ousted following uh, some revelations about behavior, uh, all of that tied up in the Me Too movement at the same time. And so there's this porous boundary between internal life in organizations and larger social movements in society that are really a dynamic playing back and forth every day. And so uh, I think that there's external triggers where employee activism is on the rise uh, and has been. That's probably especially acute with a very tight labor market at the moment where employees have had, and we'll see if that continues in a changing economy, but have had way more power to influence corporate policy and positions than they have for a long time. And then on the internal side of things, there there are some specific signals you're kind of looking for as an entrepreneur. So when there are changes in leadership are almost always If it's a planned leadership succession, uh, legacy initiatives that the CEO and top leaders are trying to complete before retiring or moving on. Uh, And then new leaders come in and there's a big thing, isn't there, around the first 90 days, first 100 days and uh, priorities. And entrepreneurs are masterful at being responsive to these agendas and positioning what they are trying to do as being a solution in some way to the priorities that leaders are are pursuing and really are very, very attuned to changes in direction. So when companies, uh, I'm thinking of some of the tech companies who come through our classroom doing cases for our students, uh, have seen announcements about a new strategic direction, whether it be, I'm thinking Google and Amazon recently and some of the the structural changes they're pursuing, or whether it be IBM a few years ago on public commitments they were making. Uh, the public statements about the direction of the company and the statements to shareholders and the 10Ks that, that they're disclosing really give just a mountain of guidance for entrepreneurs about what they need to be prioritizing and how they need to be adapting, how they're making the case to be relevant to the needs and the interests of those who will be making the decisions ultimately. Got it. So Chris, you just mentioned there this idea of how social entrepreneurs have to make the case for change. So can you shed a little more light on that? Is, is how do you actually make the case for change? I mean, you just described how change within an organization can be driven by social entrepreneurs. But what does that look like? How do you actually make the case for change? So there's three things we look for. And it's in each of the three, it's really a mix of the business case and storytelling. So the, the business case doesn't always have to be a direct bottom line kind of Excel spreadsheet financial model, but you do need to be able to demonstrate how what you're trying to do advances the objectives of the organization. Sometimes if you're talking to the right person at the right time, you can get approval for something small, but if you want it to stick during tight budget years, during challenging conditions, during leadership changes, your initiative really needs to be aligned with what the organization is trying to do overall. Um, but then it comes into to the three elements of uh, framing what you're up about, and that's the master frame. So the case you're making matching to the organization's, what we call the management logics, how people talk about life in the organization, the language they use, the metaphors they use, the metrics they use, the sources of authority that they reference, uh, that master frame that the entrepreneurs use, they look and feel oftentimes like just a regular part of the organization. They're accepted as as uh, part of the system. And in part, that's the master frame. That's the, they make sense in the environment. And then the second one is the adapted frame that 
taking that overall story and business case, they are able to adjust how they present it depending on their audience. Uh, so what they say to the CFO may be different to the VPHR, may be different to the 20 new hires that they have the opportunity to present to. So really uh, that ability to adapt the case to the people you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. And then finally, and this is probably uh, something that we've learned in the time since we wrote the first edition of the book, is that there's also an evolving frame where we go from making a pitch, if you like, Jack, in kind of the Mad Men TV show idea of standing up and just dazzling people with your charisma. It's yeah. really not like that at all. It's about uh, collaborating and co-creating and evolving your idea and uh, incorporating people's input such that it's no longer just your idea. It's yeah. everyone's idea and people own it together. Uh, and that third evolving story, evolving frame is really the key to building the movement, building the, the network. Yeah. This is, uh, like I said, this is a, a really fascinating idea. And, you know, when, when I hear you talk about the social entrepreneur and how they can drive change and be a positive, uh, let's say, force to the organizational call or advocate, to the organizational culture and to positive organizational change, you know, over and over, you're mentioning the, these ideas that to me, they correlate, I would say, to strong leadership, you know, mindset and innovation and value driven interest and they're skillful navigators and they're motivated to make a change, but yet they're without authority, right? At least formal authority. And so it seems to me that if you're going through a large scale organizational change in my context, right, in Nestle and Associates, we do a lot of ERP organizational change. And, and that's no small feat, right? That's a pretty large, mm -hmm. substantial talk, you know, organizational capital, time, money and effort. It's pretty substantial. And the more that you have these social entrepreneurs that, you know, like you said, they, they develop a business case, they're good at storytelling, they can frame the case, uh, they can adapt the case to the people you're speaking to, you know, so whether that social entrepreneur is somebody who's fairly new, you know, six months on the job, and they're a machine operator out on the floor, or they're the CEO sitting in the desk up in the corner, um, you need those people. And it seems to me that the more of those social entrepreneurs that you have, and they advocate and they can share that vision and mission of the objectives of what's driving the change, the more effective and efficient that change can be, right? Does that make sense what I'm saying? It, it, you know, the more social entrepreneurs that you have within your organization that can kind of vouch for the change and they support the change and they have all these skills and these attributes that you speak of, man, I, you know, give me a whole handful of those, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I love how you put that, Jack. Um, because you think back to the Gallup stats that we just shared, and I'm 68% less than actively engaged at work right now. And I, that might be lowballing it from a lot of, of my conversations in organizations right now. Give me social entrepreneurs any day of the week whose energy and ideas are and commitment are really there, who you may have to work hard to kind of channel and focus and to make sure everyone's pulling towards the right agenda. Give me those people any day of the week than people who have checked out, yeah, or who are acting out, or who are about to walk out of the organization. Uh, because it's once you've got momentum, you can channel it. But getting momentum in the first place, that can be hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, talking about checking out, I mean, when, you know, the, the large uh, organizational change, it can be disruptive and it can be very challenging. Sure. And, you know, all these things, again, that you're mentioning to me are just these things that make up, let's say, a social entrepreneur. I mean, these are these are strong leadership qualities, but yet they have them without the authority and they're highly motivated. To have these attributes and to make them useful within an organization, it's not just about the skills and the attributes and the, you know, the being the charismatic and telling stories and being good at it. Uh, it's also being motivated to put those tools to use. And I think, you know, you mentioned, what was it, 60 some percent of, of organizations, you know, the, the employees are disengaged. I probably have had some experiences where I would say it's much lower than that. Sure. So I, I guess my next question is this. When you talk about change and organizational change, 
who should be involved and what are the social networks? And I know you talk about this in your book, but I want to just drill a little bit deeper into that idea with our listeners. Is it up to the leadership team to really pinpoint the social entrepreneurs? And is that where they should start because they can be effective advocates for change? Or what does that look like? How do you know who to engage in the effort and and what are these social networks and how can you leverage them? We often talk about pointing towards a support sandwich. So you can think about uh, the meat in the middle being the project itself, the change agenda itself, but you're going to need both the champions, the senior executives on board, but you're also going to need the implementers on board to be successful, following along with their heads, their hearts, and their hands, so they really understand what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, and how they can help, how they can be a part of it. And oftentimes in preparing for change, we find that organizations and leaders don't necessarily go far enough to help the implementers be ready to be successful. I I don't know if that's your experience too, Jack, in the work that you do. Uh, So looking at the networks themselves, think about champions, think about implementers and that support sandwich. Uh, I could go into 45 minutes of nerdy kind of (laughs) network analysis stuff, but uh, maybe I'll just instead quote uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who simplifies it really nicely in in the tipping point. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, He points to three kinds of network influences in social movements. He points to mavens, who are sources of information. They're the people who know what the new strategic announcement is before it's announced. Uh, They're the people who know the preferences of the new leader of a division before the leader's in place and before they've been announced. So these are the people who have the pulse of the organization you want to have in in your change team. Then Gladwell also looks at connectors so, so much of organizational life is conducted in silos and in teams mm-hmm. and in your own little bubble. And I think given the shift to be more hybrid or remote now, that is even more the case than before. And Gladwell points to connectors as being those people who are horizontals, not verticals. They connect the different divisions, the different teams. And those people are key for ideas spreading quickly and for concepts to be uh, more complete because of their ability to see the 3D, not just the 2D version of things. Um, And so Connect is the second kind of uh, network influencer. And then the third one is uh, salespeople. And so those people who are just influential at getting support for their ideas uh, by virtue of their position and authority, but also because of their personal characteristics. Some people are are really good at uh, convincing people of their ideas, building rapport with others. And so you need to have some of those people in your change team as well. And so those couple of frameworks, I think, are helpful when you think about who do you want to get involved and what are the social networks? Would you say that typically your social entrepreneurs are also your salespeople? Sometimes, but not always, actually. There's an interesting kind of inclusion element to this, that sometimes entrepreneurs are successful by virtue of the the teams they can build rather than their personal attributes and personal preferences. As you probably know, Jack, from the research, women and people of color are routinely overlooked when they, they have, or disproportionately overlooked, let's say, uh, when they have good ideas and have input uh, compared to, to white men uh, like myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the, there is a role to play of allyship here that uh, sometimes entrepreneurs are just really good at recruiting allies uh, who are able to be heard, who do get a seat at the table more often than, than some underrepresented groups do. And so I'd say that it can be the case that entrepreneurs are really charismatic and great at making the, the case, but I don't think it's essential. I think they're just really effective at getting the right combination of people to work together. Yeah. And Chris, I think the whole point in your idea with who should be involved and what are the social networks, I really think to me, it's, it's this idea that this idea just takes some reflection and consideration for change, right? I mean, it's a real thing. 
So, you know, when you talked about this idea of silos and teams and, and as a result, perhaps politics, right? You know, I do think within organizations, there's politics, but then there's also good politics. You know, politics isn't all, always bad. And then you talk about the idea of, you know, just seeing the 3D and not just the 2D and leveraging salespeople and allies. And for me, I think that that's a very powerful idea, you know, just creating these advocates for change and these social networks that can help support that change. And correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, when you talk about the idea of social networks, half the battle is just understanding the value of social networks and then, and then some reflection and consideration on how to positively leverage those for change. Is that a fair statement? I think that's really well put, Jack. And when you play it out, as you are saying, being mindful about the network at play and the influences at play is, is a good start, kind of mapping that out and really taking the mindset that this is a dynamic thing. Issue selling is a dynamic thing where People are always trying to persuade decision makers and others of the things they want to advance in the organization, trying to get support. And so if you are a change maker, it's really not an option to sit on the sidewalk. It's just a question of navigating the system in a way to be effective with, with some things that are really important for you that you believe will make the organization better and, and have an impact on the people and, and communities around you. Absolutely. So Chris, you know, you, your book is talking about changing your company from the inside out. And since organizations are built by people and people have emotions and, you know, there are social networks within organizations, as we discussed, do emotions have a place in effective organizational change? And how do you address emotions specifically? Because it's, you know, let's face it, Chris, uh, I mean, organizational change can be tough and highly disruptive. And, you know, you're dealing with all sorts of wonderful human beings with various levels of tolerance and diversity in many different areas. And so does that need to be managed or not? Or what's your general thoughts there? Certainly, it's, it's so true. It, when, when you ask that question, Jack, it made me think of uh, Gib Bullock, who used to be at Accenture uh, as a leader, started the Accenture Development Program as an entrepreneur. And Gib used to talk about the corporate antibodies, how they existed to kill off anything that didn't look yeah. like them. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you think about the question of emotions, uh, people do have that, that, and organizations have this kind of, emotional reaction to change where for every action there's an equal opposite reaction to push back against it and and so really the art of the entrepreneur is to really make a case that plays to the aspirations of the culture of the leaders around them, the people around them the better world that they can see without and, and really the the optimism, the possibility uh, of that, um, without triggering as much of that fear-based response that really stifles progress. And that yeah. Can be hard, I yeah, and Chris, and one of the reasons I actually brought that question up is because you mentioned a great point on your website, actually, and you talk about this idea of strategic implementation, right? And along with that, your website says, quote, we believe the process of cultural change needs to be authentic and human. And so when I saw that, you know, when you, if you're authentic and human, that means you've got emotions, right? And everyone has emotions. So just thought I would uh, run that one by you. Strategic implementation without considering the human element, I think you're, you're bound for failure. And that actually brings us really nicely back around full circle to one of your early questions, Jack. And it gave me uh, the opportunity to mention the build framework, uh, building the yeah. bank, And that's really infused with authenticity and humanity. Um, the idea of being curious as the first step in change is kind of counter. It flips the script to how many people talk about and think about change, of driving change and leading change. Be curious is the first step. Connecting with people, listening, understanding. Uh, unleashing the influences is, again, uh, because of that humanity and that authenticity that in any change, there will be some people who are on board early, hopefully, and there'll be some people who won't yeah. be. 
and it will take a while. And so really engaging those early adopters as your partners and being respectful to those who are not ready for the change uh, and and have good input and concerns that need to be considered and, and addressed. And then infusing the process with and the culture with purpose and vision and values and the things that really do uplift people. Leading positively, uh, helping people grow and develop on the journey. And then finally, deepening the change and recognizing that willpower is not enough when it comes to change. That with just good intentions, we're kind of uh, going to splash the water around for a while, but but it's just going to keep going back the way it was going uh, once the attention shifts. And so just recognizing that that is human nature. And so, so setting things in place such that it sticks. Yeah. Well, Chris, what a fun topic and conversation. Before I let you go today, I do want to ask you two more questions. With your great experience, you know, both in terms of more on the, let's call it academia and research side of things, but certainly in practice and with your experience. And again, I, I really appreciated your work and your book and this idea of social entrepreneur and, you know, someone who creates positive change without authority. When you go into organizations and you meet with leadership teams and CEOs and, you know, and CXOs, um, you know, one of the things I just mentioned earlier is that I think part of your point with talking about social networks is that it all starts with awareness and reflection and consideration of this idea, you know, this whole idea of your book. When you go into organizations, do you find that most leadership teams consider that when they're getting ready to undergo organizational change or or not? I think it depends on the leader, certainly. But the point is that people want to create, they want to contribute. And just over time, organizations can naturally become blocked. The system gets blocked up and everything in organizational change starts with opening communication back up. Uh, and that's where I think leaders, once they they appreciate that and, and lean into that, really start to just uh, be amazed by how much potential and brilliance and creativity and possibility is there in the organization right in front of their, their very eyes. And it's really an inspiring journey yeah. to see the leaders yeah. go on as well. So I, I'd say there's some leaders have it already, but those who don't, just it's really fun to see the kind of the mindset shift that happens on these journeys. That's great. Yeah. To support the journey. Well, Chris, my last question for you, if you're going to give advice or what we call that one golden nugget to an organization preparing for an ERP organizational change, uh, so a significant organizational change endeavor. What takeaway would you like to leave with our listeners that could benefit them in their organizations? It's a three-parter because I'm cheating, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, uh, open communication, become responsive, and aim higher. And I'd like to leave Jack with a, a quote from uh, a colleague of mine uh, from a business here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Zingerman's. So the, the co-founder, Ari Weinzweig, likes to say, success doesn't mean that you have no problems. Success means that you have better problems. <laughs> and so my, my, my wish is just for organizations and leaders to, to open communication, become responsive, aim higher, and earn some better problems. Super. Chris, thank you so much for your time today. I really do appreciate uh, your work. I appreciate your time. Can you tell our listeners uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Sure thing. Um, certainly feel free to check us out at riverbankconsultinggroup.com and uh, feel free to message me on LinkedIn. Sounds good. And we will certainly have that information in our show notes. Chris, thank you again. Be well. And uh, we'll certainly talk soon. Terrific. Thanks for having me, Jack. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the ERP OCJ podcast. 